Okay, thank you. First of all, I just want to say thank you to the Department of Decentralization for setting up uh, Protocol Burga. I think we're all excited to see something uh, set up like this that focuses on the technology, governance, and society without any sponsors. So again, a nice thank you to them. I'm happy to be speaking here today. So uh, first about me, um, my name is Phil. Uh, I started working in uh, blockchain in 2013 here in Berlin at a small startup called Bitcoins Berlin doing marketing and communications for a Bitcoin payment service that later turned into Bitwalla or Nuri. Uh, then after that, I worked at Parity from the end of 2017 until last year and Chainsafe after that as well. Currently, uh, head of communications at Missing Link, and I've, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, pokabeat.org and what it's for today. So, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the significance of decentralization, the challenges in measuring it, and using two main examples uh, of L2s and how it's much more difficult to measure decentralization in L2s than it is for L1s. Using Ethereum and Polkadot as examples, the two protocols I have most experience in. Um, and then about how we should communicate and educate about decentralization. Yeah, so we're here because of decentralization and its significance on society. It provides resilience, censorship resistance, transparency, and democratic-like functionality. It helps provide assurances and protections for users, creators, and maintainers alike, yet definitely comes with its own challenges of governance and adaptability. So I first heard about Bitcoin when reading an article about the Silk Road drug market. And I have already was interested in technology and you know, society and all these uh, crypto anarchist uh, type topics, and I thought Silk Road was super interesting, but I thought immediately, okay, well, they're going to be able to, it's difficult to shut down a Tor Onion site, but they're going to definitely get the payment system, because they've done that in the past with uh, Liberty Reserve. But when I looked further into it, and I discovered Bitcoin, and realized that it would, that wouldn't be an easy task either, uh, that's when I realized the power of decentralization, and I'm sure all of you have your own stories as well. So the node operators weren't liable for what happens on the network. In fact, they didn't really know what was going on other than uh, validating payments. Um, and payers were guaranteed that the payment would re reach the destination, and receivers can guarantee no chargebacks. Um, and there's a very unlikely risk of the network going down. So this, this like showed me there's an opt-in system that creates a level playing field for all users due to the nature of decentralized blockchain technology. Uh, while Silk Road has been shut down, Bitcoin still lives on. Um, decentralization is not a meme for bootstrapping. It's vital to the functions of a fair system with a level playing field. Decentralization protects users, creators, and contributors. Users rely less on tr the trust, trusting the creators and contributors, maintainers, from making malicious upgrades or rugging, or even trusting that they'll continue to live. And uh, there's risks of, de of centralization, we all know of definite like centralized uh, exchanges um, going down. Uh, it does have its benefits, let me start with that. Uh, you can do quick and simple governance with uh, upgradability and adaptability, that's very quick, Sim similar to all businesses that exist right now. Um, and so what happens when we do have centralization? Uh, we live in a world with centralized institutions and uh, the centralized institutions that are connected to our decentralized protocols are the most prone to attack and failure. Like exchanges such as Quadriga and FTX, uh, Quadriga where the founder with the private keys allegedly died, um, networks such as Multichain where the founder was arrested 
in China, allegedly, and has the private keys that control the network. Uh, and even to an extent, uh, having a single uh, point of failure, such as the software of Bitcoin Core, being the only client for Bitcoin, only major client for Bitcoin. So there are challenges in me measuring decentralization, uh, but I'd like to start first on definitions. I really am not a fan of digging into deep definitions. I would like to go with a very broad approach of L2s. If you think it's an L2, it probably is. Um, I think that, uh, and like decentralization as well. Um, but we're gonna just, just as an example, quickly we'll use L2 beats uh, definition that defines a L2 chain that is fully or partially derives, deriving its security from an L1. So regarding L1s, we've reached a point where we have a pretty standardized way of measuring how, to, how decentralized the chain is, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, such as the miner or validator distribution, uh, including pools. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of talk right now about mining pools or validation pools uh, on Ethereum, and this is nothing new if you know the history of Bitcoin. In 2014, there was a mining pool called Ghash that achieved over 50% of, of the, the mining power. And in that day, uh, there was some resilient mechanism due to decentralization where the miners pulled out of the pool because the price was dropping due to the threat of centralization. They also made a promise to keep their hash rate below 40%. So there's another team in this space that has done that recently. Uh, token distribution and, or the Nakamoto coefficient, so how well distributed are the tokens. This is definitely very important if you have uh, a proof of stake network, uh, which is one of the major reasonings for uh, doing the irregular state change for the DAO hack, and um, as well as if you have on-chain governance, it's especially. <laughs> Interesting, but this this poses a problem. This is hard to measure because it's trivial to obfuscate with uh, without an identity-based service and software accessibility. So, Bitcoin was designed for anyone to mine. Technically, anyone can mine on any hardware, though the odds of profiting from that are very very low. Um, but you can definitely see where soft software accessibility is more difficult on other networks such as Solana where the cost to run a validator node is extremely high. And governance, so how are these L1s upgrading themselves and adapting? Do they only support backwards compatible upgrades and how are they doing that? Is there, are there spheres of influence that have much more power or is it well decentralized? But these are the main ways we've been looking at L1 decentralization. So as roadmaps have altered and the technology has progressed, there's a lot of complexities when looking at L2s and their decentralization. The traditional metrics I talked about do apply but aren't sufficient to measure the decentralization of L2s. So parameters to measure for L2s that are common, especially on Ethereum, uh, this, I'm focusing on Ethereum right now, but the sequencer, this is one of the biggest uh, topics right now, um, and it's kind of ironic that this point of centralization in L2s is getting the most attention because, in my opinion, this is the least egregious offender where it's, you still are pretty safe with a single sequ sequencer. Uh, the L1 smart contracts that connect the L1 to the L2, uh, this is where things get extremely complex because you have not only upgradability but multiple upgradable contracts that are in all controlled with different keys and different th uh, multi-sig thresholds. This makes uh, maintaining it, maintaining the overview of a decentralization of an L1 extremely difficult, and I'd like to really thank L2Beat for their amazing work on monitoring that for all of us. Operator proposer, um, this can you know, help with MEV attacks if the centralized operator decides to do that. 
they can go offline, although there are ways of force withdrawing uh, if the operator goes offline or for the sequencer including, force including your transaction in there. So with regard to optimistic rollups, uh, fraud proofs uh, aren't always decentralized either. Um, sometimes, well, if, if they're even active. So if a fraud proof is active, um, there are many cases where in order to challenge the state, uh, you need to be whitelisted. So you need to be allowed to challenge uh, the roll-up. And uh, many uh, are just allowing themselves to be the only ones who can challenge that. That's like allowing replies only for the people you follow, but you only follow yourself. Uh, validity proofs uh, have a centralization uh, aspect to them for ZK rollups, which is the cost of computation. Um, does the cost of computation limit participants uh, and therefore moves the needle toward effective centralization? But that is quickly improving with efficiency as well. And governance. So each L2 has its own governance system. And that, that is probably the most complex part to follow. Um, each has its own culture of governance, uh, its own rules for how those proposals are voted on, who is able to participate, how they're able to participate, and how the approved proposals actually go from approved to executed on chain, which is a, also another point of failure that can happen. How much time do I have? <laughs> okay, perfect. So the real challenge is that L2s present an entirely new problem. Uh, the umbrella of trust that Ethereum L2s have received has created a situation where users learned about these centralization risks after they agreed to participate. Um, I know for me, I was watching tons of talks uh, at other conferences before these rollups were launched and I don't remember the founders of these protocols talking about how they're gonna launch centralized, although they, they may have said that clearly, but it's easy to just also uh, not only um, gain the security of a chain, but the culture, culture as well, or an understanding that they're decentralized because the L1 is decentralized. So uh, another part of my expertise is Polkadot. I've been highly active in the Polkadot community ever since launch and before. Um, and before I go into the L2s in Polkadot, I want to talk about the launch process of Polkadot itself, which I think uh, presents a good standard for how to launch uh, a centralized chain and turn it decentralized. So the first one, the first thing that was done was the token sale, and there are other ways to achieve this, not necessarily you don't have to do this way, I'm not saying it, but it is a good example. Um, there was a predetermined amount of distribution, and that distribution was transparent and effective on chain. Uh, other teams said that they would never do a token, and then ended up with one one day. Uh, this 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 doesn't really create trust, and it is a broken promise as well. So on the Bankless website says things like, as with Arbitrum, the spray and pray strategy to maximize surface area as a user is likely best. And that's telling people to basically do as much activity as possible on a chain in hopes that you'll be rewarded for activity with future tokens. So then Polkadot, uh, after the token sale, when it finally launched, uh, the Genesis block started but there were centralized and permission validators set, uh, run by the Web3 Foundation, which is uh, helping Polkadot. Let me just go here. Then, tokens that were bought in the pre-sales were distributed to the accounts, and they were locked. They were kept in place, and you couldn't do anything with them. And then, you were able to only vote with the tokens. You couldn't transfer them. And what you could vote for in this case was the validator set. So many validators were on board in the queue, and they, because it's a distributed proof of stake-like system, they were able to vote for a decentralized validator set. Then on-chain governance was enabled, which again is very specific to Polkadot. 
but with those locked tokens, the users themselves voted to enable token transfers. And that, after all these steps and after the decentralization happened, then the token value became a thing. So parachains inherit the security of Polkadot relay chain, uh, proofs of new state transitions that occur on a parachain must be validated against the registered state transition function that is stored in the relay chain. So basically it says, this is my business logic, I'm a parachain. The relay chain says, okay, and you better follow those rules with every block you give us. So parachains on Polkadot using Polkadot SDK are built uh, entirely differently than L2s. They're mostly similar to each other, but they're, they're all very different from an Ethereum L2. The main thing, uh, collators, which is the same thing as a sequencer. Pseudo is definitely um, a big part of, of Polkadot. And during the launch process, in order to enable upgrades while it was centralized, there's a pseudo feature so that an, a single account owner can upgrade instantly or a multi-sig can do that as well. And this is a single point of centralization on Polkadot parachains that still exists on some. Uh, the governance can be centralized, so if you have a council that isn't elected by token holders, that is your own team, it's the same thing effectively as having pseudo but with a delay. So I decided to, I really liked L2B when I was learning about centralization of parachains and uh, I thought it would be funny to create one for Polkadot called Polkabeat, and because I thought most of them, even me, were decentralized. And that wasn't the case, and I quickly learned how scary this is uh, for some of the major parachains on Polkadot. Uh, as you can see, Astar, one of the biggest ones on Polkadot, it still has pseudo active with a three of five multi-sig, so they can do instantaneous upgrades at will. Um, and some other major ones don't really have a democratic council, which is also the same. But I just want to give a shout out to Centrifuge, Hyder DX, Fallen Network, and Kilt, as well as Zeitgeist, they recently uh, did, did as well. So those are the five main ones on Polkadot that are decentralized, according to my model. And there's many, many more parachains that haven't uh, launched their token yet, new chains coming on board that haven't really distributed their token or put it on an exchange. And I don't consider them under scrutiny here because I believe in that Polkadot launch process where you can decentralize first, then release the token because it protects people. So just wrapping up here, um, this is my old one. Yeah, yeah. this is my old slides here, so I'm gonna just go into this uh, real quick. So we are all centralized and immutable people, and mutable, um, but we can follow principles of decentralization and the actions of how we communicate with others. This is a governance and society talk more than anything, and the things I'm about to say, I try to remind myself of as much as possible. I'm not perfect either. But just like decentralization, we should be resi resilient and resistant to the temptations of centralization as much as possible, especially when real value is at stake and everyday users aren't aware of these things. We should be communicating this as well. Just do this real quick. We should be censorship resistant and keep an open dialogue. Just, Francie, just as Francie said earlier today, uh, you know, using attacks and so on, I think a lot of people may not be as educated as you or me. Um, we should educate them and keep an open dialogue and not hurl insults at each other online. It looks bad and it's not helpful. Uh, if somebody doesn't know what a trusted setup is, doesn't mean they're wrong about everything else. Um, we should also be transparent and accountable. If you, keep, if you make promises, keep them. We should keep our own ecosystems accountable as well and not run away from these hard truths. 
So thank you. That's my talk. <laughs>